some expert chairing uh, of, of the second session. Uh, uh, and we're going to look at the power of genetic selection and big data. Uh, this next session is chaired by my colleague from the AFB board, Dr. Michelle Costello-Smith, uh, who has been on the board now for a couple of years, but cr uh, critically chairs the very important science strategy committee within the AFB board. Michelle, you're very welcome. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for that introduction, um, Colm. I was going to introduce myself, but it's even more pleasurable to be introduced, so thank you very much. I have the pleasure today of um, chairing I, what I hope will be a very stimulating scientific discussion, and we had an excellent prelude into this, um, I suppose, genetic discussion uh, following our last conversation regarding, you know, TB and cattle breeding indices. So today we're going to be talking about driving innovation and really this scientific technology is moving at an incredible pace. And this scientific session regarding data is critical in relation to how we future manage um, the agri-food industry and even at a farm level. Data powers everything that we do and is a valuable commodity. And we in the AFB board and AFB recognize that this is important and we are investing in genomic capabilities within the organization in order to be in this exciting space. Today, I'm really looking forward to learning from the speakers. And our first speaker is going to be Professor Donna Berry from Chagas, who has a PhD in animal genetics and a principal investigator in the statistical genetics department at Chagas, and has been responsible for the development of the national cattle breeding objectives, including estimating the genetic merit for all traits. And those of you who have heard Donna speak before are in for a real treat. And he's after traveling up from Cork safely to be here with us today. Our second speaker is Dr. Stephen Morrison from AFBI. After gaining his agricultural degree and PhD, he now is a program leader of sustainable livestock production research at AFB and has been part of the team responsible for the implementation of the bovine information system. Stephen is going to ask the question of us, what is big data and what it, does it mean for livestock farming? In addition, he will inform us about the transformative technologies coming our way. So without further ado, I want to give you, ask you to give a warm welcome to Professor Donna Berry to the stage, please. Okay, thanks Michelle. And um, I guess Michelle would know and all the other ladies in the audience would know as being a typical man, I didn't read the instructions until I actually had the presentation done, so my title is a little bit different to what was actually in the, um, the agenda. I actually spend, as a researcher, you'd think I'd spend a lot of time researching, but I actually spend most of my time fighting with nutritionists and physiologists and vets about the power of genetics and what genetics can deliver. And I would argue that breeding is essentially free. Um, in the most contexts, you have to put the animal in calf or in lamb to get an actual uh, progeny or get the animal lactating. So you might as well put good genetics in there as put bad genetics in there. But also importantly, it's what I say, it's cumulative and permanent. So what that means is you can build on generations. So the, the, the performance of your animals this year are an artifact of the previous few generations. While on the flip side, if you actually take your eye off the ball, and this is crucially important in the volatility that we're seeing, especially say in the dairy market, milk price is low, people say, oh, I won't bother milk recording, I won't bother using artificial insemination, I'll just use a natural mating bull for this year. If you introduce bad genes into the herd, either through, as we talked earlier about TB, then it's going to be generations or years before you can actually eradicate them. From a management side, I would argue it's costly. Vaccinations is costly. Using reproductive technologies is costly. Nutrition, feeding the animals is costly. Um, it is, most certainly is, and I would have to admit it, it is a quick fix solution. So if you put a, a seed or, or treat an animal for, for any reproductive disorder, you will more likely get the animal sought than it will go in calf. But you're probably going to keep the replacement from that animal. So you're actually just exacerbating the problem the whole time. Um, and it does require to be ongoing. So for example, genetics is cumulative and permanent, while management, you have to keep doing that management influence every single year. 
If you just take dairy as a great example, and you'll see a lot of my, my talk are the examples from a dairy front, and that's not um, just simply because we're not really seeing the same at the moment in beef and in sheep, and dairying is really being put up there as a pedestal. So this is, what we have is our, our EBI, is our National Breeding Index, it's very similar to your PLI, it's a profit-based index in euro terms, and you can see euro per lactation profit is on the vertical axis. Now what you can see was pretty stagnant until the year 2000. Nothing really happened, and that's when we introduced the EBI. I would like to argue, of course, that's when I started working for Chagas, but that's when we introduced the EBI, and we gained at five euros per year profit. Then we introduced our national breeding program, so we have our AI companies, but they all came together under a single umbrella and decided we're actually going to do something here. We're going to set up what we call Gene Ireland. That drove genetic gain by 12 euros per year. Genomic technologies, we were the second in the world to introduce them into dairying officially. We launched them in 2009. That drove genetic gain up to 25 euros per year. If you actually, because remember I said it's cumulative and permanent, <clears throat> so if you actually summed up the benefits, and I just did it the other day, since the year 2000 until today, it has been worth 1.1 billion euros to the Irish dairy industry. Now you might go, wow, that's mad. That's absolutely terrible. There is a huge room for improvement in that. That is far less efficient of where we actually should be. But it just shows you 1.1 billion euros, so our herd size is around 1.3 million euros, gone from around 1.1 up, that is still low relative to where we should actually be going. Okay? So there's huge gains to be achieved there. Now, it's a kind of an unwritten uh, issue in, when you give a talk in, in statistical genetics that you have to present at least one equation. So this is my one equation for today. And if you have some geneticist friends, they'd like to tell you how, how difficult things are in genetics. It actually can all be boiled down into this one equation. There are simply four things that affect genetic gain. It could be genetic gain for milk, for growth, for TB, for health, whatever. It's exactly the same principle. So what I'm going to do for most of my talk is I'm actually going to take each one of these components and focus on it and see where are the gains to achieve, especially in relation to big data. Right? And then at the end, we'll, we'll talk about opportunities and challenges. And I'm also going to pepper it up with a few case studies from an Irish situation. The key thing here, and uh, even though geneticists like myself are pretty ignorant and are arrogant, there, we can't be ignorant to the fact that management has to move with us. So there has to be some level of co-evolution of management with genetics. And this is what, a large extent, would have got us into where some of the dilemmas that we're currently in from a breeding perspective. Management did not keep up with, with genetics. So let's focus on the first one in green, the intensity of selection. So most traits would follow what we call a normal distribution. You've got the, the great, the excel people or, or cattle, and then you've got the poor ones, and then you've got the average. Okay? If we're looking at selection intensity, what we want to do is we want to identify who are the best. So in this situation, we might screen a population, and we find out those ones in red, and they're our best, and they're, on, a, on this index, they're around 425 euros above the the, the the, of zero, so they're around 125 euros above the, the mean. But actually, if we were to screen more animals, so this big data concept, be it at a DNA level or be it just at measuring the traits of individual animals, um, I'm not sure in Northern Ireland perspective, but we milk record around half of our cows. What if we milk recorded all of our cows? We'd actually push out that distribution, and you can see with the blue line, we're actually missing some of the elite animals. So if we just do a little bit of maths on side of that, and on the bottom here I show the proportions selected. So if we selected 50% of the individuals, you can see on the, on, the, on the very bottom, that's a gain of zero or, or of one. Now, if we were to actually select our top 15% uh, of animals, we would get twice, the, their average would be twice that as if we selected 50. So in other words, we would double our genetic gain by selecting the top 15% as opposed to selecting the top 50%. Now, of course, you can see it's exponential. So if we go to the top 5%, we're now after tripling our genetic gain. And this is all about screening the population. Whatever technology you want to use, whatever trait you want to use, screen the population to identify the best individuals, all else being equal, of course. So you can see that that is really addressing the green component of my four different points of, of my simple equation. The next one in blue, the middle one, is where us as geneticists put most of our work into. That's the accuracy of selection. So if you open up a ram catalog or a bull catalog or a boar catalog, whatever, what you'll see is you'll see some measure of genetic merit. 
And then you'll also see some measure of accuracy if you're using sheep or beef or reliability if you're using dairy animals. All that really tells us or tells you is how confident are we on that genetic merit figure. So if the bull is a plus 200 kilograms of milk with 30% reliability, we're not really sure. It could be 300 kilos. It could be minus 100 kilos. We're only 30% sure of that. While if the same bull was 99% reliability, we're telling you that that bull is plus 100 kgs and it's not going to move that much. So you must be very confident in those figures. What drives the reliability is largely, we'll talk about this in a second, data. So on the bottom axis, and this is, could be any type of species, this is the reliability of a bull or of a ram or of a boar, of a goat, whatever, for a different number of progeny. So take, for example, anybody, humans, right? If you have a kid and your kid is tall, there's a bit of a chance you're carrying the tall genes. Now if you had 20 kids and they're all tall, there's a pretty good chance you are carrying the, the, 20, uh, the, the, the height genes. Now if you had 300 kids, there is a pretty, pretty good chance you are carrying the high genes, height genes. Height in humans is around 80% genetic. Okay? So it actually only takes around three or four kids for us to say, yeah, you're carrying the height genes. So therefore your kids are probably carrying the height genes. Fertility, health, is more lowly heritable. So it's what we say it's only 5% or 2% heritable. So what you can see, the, the reliability is on the vertical axis. It takes more data for these traits to achieve this high accuracy. Look at my equation. If we have half the accuracy, we have half the genetic gain. Or let's put a positive spin on it. If we double the accuracy, we double the genetic gain. What really drives that predominantly is, is data. So you can see here if we had 50 progeny for a heritable trait like, like fertility or health, our accuracy is only, our reliability is only 30%. For milk production, it's 35% heritable, it's almost 90%. So when you open up that catalogue and you see this bull or this ram and he's 30 progeny and 90% reliability with milk but only 35% reliability for fertility. That's the reason why. If you look at the far right of the graph and you can extend it a little bit longer, what it clearly shows is that we can get 100% accuracy for everything. So people talk about low heritability, and I, I was taught the wrong thing in college. I was taught low heritability means you can't make progress. Absolutely rubbish. The number of fingers we're born with, that is 100% heritable. It's 100% genetic. So I was taught in college, high heritability, you can change it fast. We can't change the number of fingers we're born with, right? Because there is no, the, the yellow guy in the box, genetic variability. There's no genetic variability. So don't go away here thinking that low heritability, health, Simon is gone. He must have known I was going to give this talk. Oh, he's coming in. Low heritability of health and fertility traits. Vets will tell you, breeding, waste of time, waste of time. Too slow. Complete rubbish. We can make as fast genetic progress in fertility or TB, mastitis, lameness, as we did in milk, in dairy cows, or growth rate in any other species. If the willingness is there to do it, and I wouldn't recommend we should do it, because what you'll end up in dairy cattle going back to having goats with no milk. Right? But the, the potential is actually there to do it because there is a load of variability, right? and if we can get that accuracy up to the very top corner... Heritability is irrelevant. The blue thing is gone. It's gone to 100%. Selection intensity, very, very high. I've just told you, you'll have to take my word for it. Genetic variability is as large in fertility as it is in milk production. So therefore, genetic gain is actually exactly the same. Now, the dilemma or the, the, the challenge is can we get that blue line to the right as fast as possible and get this high accuracy? And these are the main issues. More records, very, very simple. Lads, let's collect more data. I shared a podium with one of the top farmers in Ireland recently and, I, and he was talking about collecting health data and, putting it and, and doing evaluations for it. And I said, do you put your health data into the database? And he said, no. The best farmer in the, world, in the country, and he's not putting data into the database. So how am I, in my apparently ivory tower down in Moor Park, supposed to tell him that that's a good bull and that's a bad bull if nobody's actually giving us the data to do that? We can bypass a lot of this through the incorporation of genomic information or DNA information. But the two things I want to talk a little bit about is increasing the heritability. See the heritability going from 5% to 30%? If us as, as statisticians or even through having better data can increase that heritability, we can actually get higher accuracy straight away and then using correlated information. 
So I know I said you have to present one equation, but Sinclair told me that this is a highly intellectual group, so you're going to get two equations. And this is what the heritability is. It's the genetic variation divided by the genetic variation plus noise. Right? Anybody who's mathematically minded would suggest if you reduce the noise, heritability goes to one. Right? So if I was to walk 10 cows or 10 sheep or 10 lambs past everyone here and ask you all to score locomotion, do you think you'll all score the same? No. If I was to give you a litre of milk and show you here's one litre, because this is essentially what happens in milk recording, would you all say that's a litre of milk? Probably. There is a huge amount of noise in health data, fertility data, etc. Right? So it's how do we reduce that noise? Pedigree errors. Anybody here lambing? I saw Crosby around. Anybody lambing? He comes out and does around 30 lambs on the ground. Mismuttering going on. Right? In sheep in Ireland, around 13% of the parentage errors is incorrect. In cattle, in dairy cattle, it's around 7.5% in, in, in the Republic. And around 13%, 14% in commercial suckers. If you have 10% pedigree errors, if you were to fix them through DNA technology, you can increase your heritability by 25%. Right? Very, very simply, straight away. If we look at some of the work from Nottingham, Melissa Royal stuff, were based on commercial farms, good commercial farms where they're measuring progesterone, 5% of the cows were inseminated at the wrong time of their cycle. There was no way they were going to go in calf. And here we are, then as geneticists, we don't know that information, so we just assumed it as part of the genetics of the cow. Oh, she was genetically poor, she never went in calf. But of course it was the farmer's fault, it was the noise. If we were to reduce that, then the heritability goes up. Incidentally, in that study, I think the heritability of pregnancy rate was 14%, while everywhere else it's around 3%, because she corrected out some of that noise. If we take repeated measures, we had a quick chat about sensory analysis. If we get 20 people to record the quality of the steak. What you're doing is some are overestimating, some are underestimating. If you average out that noise, you get less noise on average, so the heritability goes up. Still, in the face of all that, as I said, even with low heritability, if we record lots of data, we can still get high accuracy. The last one is exploiting correlated traits, and this is where I see a bit of use of what we call now precision ag. Right? Um, so we all know cell count and mastitis are correlated, right? not one is to one. Genetically, there's around 0.7 of a correlation. Locomotion and lameness, pretty well correlated, not one is to one, but if the cow isn't walking very well, chances are it's, it's lame-ish. Body condition score, health and fertility, we've known that now for 20 years. So why can't we use that information to help us identify these genetically elite animals at a younger age? So we, know, we all know we all know the bull whose cows are in good condition, nearly always, most of them go back in calf. So we should be incorporating that information. And what I'm showing you here, and this is, this is the, a geneticist's ignorant understanding of correlation traits. There's people in this audience that can think of a lot of other things, and I'll come up with a little suggestion in a second. But what I'm showing you here is, again, the same thing as the reliability for mastitis. If you were to select just on mastitis alone, you see the blue line? It's very slow in getting off the blocks, getting high accuracy. If we were to, in green, if we were to use somatic cell count with mastitis to help us predict other health, we can get there very, very faster. Eventually, they all plateau to the same um, asthmatose. So here's a little something that I had to throw in after I read the title of the talk, is using correlated traits. So most people in dairy, you know, you milk the cows twice or three times per day. So you have this access to this biological sample, which is largely an artifact of what's happening in that cow, the physiological or metabolic status. Right? That's subjected to some sort of milk testing either once a month or, or once every two months. What actually happens is light is shone through that. And based on the absorbance of that light, within, based on the molecules within that, the light is absorbed and it produces this type of a wavelength picture right, or a spectrum. We know that we can use this to predict fatty acids, saturated fatty acid content with 98% accuracy. We've validated this thoroughly across a number of different populations across a number of different countries. Protein fractions with around 74%. Energy intake, energy balance, feed efficiency. You look at that energy intake or energy balance is 69%. You say, that's terrible. But your energy balance is really hard to measure anyway. It's riddled with errors. So your gold standard is already contains a large component of errors. Right? So there is, I think, a huge potential there. You look at methanes, don't get excited, 89%. That was based on a very small study. Um, but... There is a potential to use these type of technologies if we have the people in the room that understand how to exploit these, and then we can incorporate them into breeding programs. Why are we focusing on MIR? It's because every single country, cow in the country 
has a, a milk sample taken, not every, sorry, 600,000 cows in the country have a milk sample taken from it. This has already been generated. We could implement this tomorrow, essentially, and the farmer would incur no cost. I'm sure he'd be charged for it, but he would incur no cost. Right? So it's value add. The, the, the yellow one is genetic variability. Uh, how much genetic variation is there? And this is largely a function of inbreeding to some extent. It is where your breeding programs come into play. And I'll talk a little bit about the use of DNA technologies here to help us minimize the accumulation of inbreeding. The potential is there to do it. But well, we're not doing it, of course, because it's a race to the top. Everybody wants the top bull. So they're making the best with the best and hopefully get the best. But genomic technology, and I'll show you how, could actually, can actually help us reduce it. And this is the importance of a kind of a centralized national breeding program where you're saying, hold on now. Of course, the average lifetime of chief executive is around five years, but nationally, we're going to be here for the next few decades. So we're not going to get rapid early genetic gain at the expense of slow, late genetic gain. We want to have consistent genetic gain. And this is just showing you some of the inbreeding trends from the, the Irish dairy herd. Um, I just want to show you an example of genomics. Oh, sorry, uh, in the case of GDPR and data confidentiality, we need to be very careful about um, <laughs> personal identities. But here's one for you now. It's kind of a pub, pub quiz, right? So we have this limousine bull with a dairy cow uh, and they're mated together, produce 50-50, 50% limousine, 50% Halston Frisch. And I don't think anybody will argue with me on that. So we have this Charlet bull mated to that crossbred. What's the breed composition of the calf? I'm sure most people will say, well, I can tell you, you're all wrong, anyway. I usually let people shout out and just shout and go, wrong, 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 wrong. You're all wrong because there's no way to know it. And you say, you're wrong, you're wrong, because it has to be 50% Charlie, 25% Limousin, and 25% Halston. And that's what everybody in the world assumes for every single species. But it doesn't have to be. Yes, it has to be 50% Charlie, assuming that you're not 10% of the time you got the pedigree wrong. But it has to be 50% Charlie. But that animal could actually be 50% Holstein and no limousine. You can see how? I'll show you a little bit clearer later on, or next slide. Or it could be 0% Holstein and 50% limousine. Right? And here's how. I'm sure many people here have brothers and sisters. Now, don't try this at home, kids. But you could actually be completely and utterly unrelated to your brother or sister. You could actually mate with them and result in no inbreeding. Yeah? So let's prove to you how this is possible, right? I think the chances is something like 10 to the minus 32 times. Uh, like it's like winning the Euro Minions around three times in succession. But here we have, everybody here has two sets of chromosomes, right? One you got from your father, one you got from your mother. So we're going to have two rams here. Uh, or two, not two rams, Jesus. Two, uh, a yo and a ram. <laughs> right? I don't know which is which, right? The... Uh, the O has two green chromosomes, the red, or the, the, the other fella has two red chromosomes. They come together, right? Remember, you get half your DNA from your father, half your DNA from the mother. So this guy in the bottom gets a green and gets a red, right? And the same thing happens, completely unrelated family happens on the other side. Right, so these two meet, and they mate. This guy in the, in the bottom, he got his red chromosome from his sire, and he got his blue chromosome from his dam, half and half, yeah? Next season, or even the same season, they're lambs. They could be twins, right? Dizygotic twins, not identical twins. They mate again. He gets half his DNA, so he got these green from the father and yellow from the dam. Have they, these two, full sibs, same parents, could bar, born the same day, are completely and utterly unrelated. Yet everybody here would assume they share half of their DNA. Those that are clever would notice that this individual is also completely unrelated to their grandparent. So you know, you, you see the baby and you say, oh, it's very much like his grandfather. It's not really much like that. That could be true. It could be, you could be completely unrelated to one of your grandparents. Right? And you could share 50% of your DNA with your other parents. This is reality. This is limousine data. This is showing us the, this is the pedigree based on what's in all of our databases. And this is the genomic. So if we look at these, these we think share 25% of their DNA. They're cousins, they're half-sibs, whatever. Look at it. Some of them are sharing none. Some of them are sharing, sharing up and around 35, 40% of their DNA. So that potential is there to use this big data because we need to have all the animals genotyped to actually do selective matings where we reduce inbreeding. The last one then is generation interval. And what that is is the average age of the animal or a parent when its progeny are born. 
A lot of people prior to DNA were working on juvenile predictors, so measuring it in the bull calf, etc. And that has really moved to DNA because DNA is a juvenile predictor. You're born with the same DNA throughout your life, right? and you retain the same DNA. But if any of you want to commit a crime, what you should do is smoke like hell and get them to take a swab from inside your, your cheek because that can alter some of your DNA. But the problem is, and people have moved away from DNA, but I, it pains me to say it, but there's more to life than genetics. Right? So if we look at milk production, for example, 35% of the difference in milk production in most species is genetic, but it's 52% repeatable, which means that there's around just as much, which is actually nothing to do to, with genetics, but it stays the same throughout an animal's life. And the, the, I would argue that some of this could be epigenetic, some of this could be the fact that the animal hurt its leg or lost one quarter early on in life, and that has a large, large consequence. But this is a role for juvenile predictors. So I, I, I'll come back to this in a second. People are moving to the next fad. I don't think there's many people working on juvenile predictors, but I still think there is a role for that, right? Because there is the science is there to show that it could actually have a role. So the second part of my talk is on opportunities and challenges. I'm not going to talk about point two because I think uh, Stephen's going to talk a little bit about it. I'm going to focus on the DNA, the genomics. That's the one that's sexy at the moment that everybody's talking about it. So I, apparently I was the first person to start genotyping cattle in Europe. And it cost me 282 euros to, to do 50,000 pieces of DNA on cattle. That was in 2008. It's now costing me less than 20, significantly less than 20. I can't tell you how much because you can have people tendering uh, and knowing what the other people are pricing, but it's significantly less than 20 euros for sheep and cattle. Right? So can we get the cost down or can we increase the return on investment? And this is just like milk recording or AI. Can we get the cost down, but can we also increase the return on investment? So I'm going to focus on that. So how do we get the cost down? Well, I'm sure you've heard as well or taught yourselves that geneticists, we just make up all these numbers and we go, ha, ha, ha. Well, we actually do. I'm going to show you how we can make up some data. And it's called imputation. So everybody here, as I said, has two strands of DNA. One you got from your father, one you got from your mother. And it's all made up of these letters, A, C, Gs, and Ts. So here is a bull, or a, a ram, or a boar, whatever. Two, two, two pieces of it, or two strands of DNA. And it has, let's say, 50,000 pieces of DNA. We spent a lot of money trying to measure those 50,000 pieces of DNA. But we're cheap, right? And in the offspring, we only want to measure 3,000 pieces of DNA. So we have lots of missing gaps. But we all learned in high school biology that you got half your DNA from your father, half your DNA from your mother, you look, you, you know that this animal is a progeny of this, and if it's not, you, you, you test it. That's what parentage testing is doing. So you can actually just make up data. And rather than paying something like 280 euros, you can potentially pay 10 euros to achieve this. Exactly the same on the other side. You have the dam. You know that calf or that lamb or that piglet has to receive half its DNA from its dam. So what you do is you impute Sequence, so everyone here has around 3 billion pieces of information. That's costing me at the moment 850 euros. I have imputed, well not me actually, somebody that works for me, has imputed 600,000 animals up to the 3 billion pieces. But it only costs us 20 euros for the 600,000 animals. So we're not very good at sums of genetics. So that's a lot of money right, that we have saved by actually making up data. It's 99%, it's almost 100% accurate if you have the both parents, and it's around 98 to 99% accurate where you just have one parent, right? But I'll, I'll, I'll suffer a drop of 2% accuracy for a drop of 95% in cost. The next aspect is return on investment. Right, so I'm coming close to the end of the talk now. Um, and a lot of people in blue are talking about the genomic evals, evaluations. Like, hand on the heart, most farmers don't really care about EPDs or EBVs or PTAs, right? That's fair to say, or indexes. A lot of people do, but they're still interested in how the animal looks and how it shapes. But you'd be fascinated by their interest in, does my bull have the myostatin gene? And about the parentage, and does my bull have this gene? And does my ram have this FECX gene? So my strategy is actually not to sell EPDs or genomic evaluations, it's to sell the stuff that people are interested in. The parentage, right? So you go, if I'm telling you that, and it's going to be the same no matter where you look, one or 10 to 13% of the errors are wrong. So if you're going buying rams and there's 10 rams in a pen, one of them isn't what you think it is. And for the sake of around 50, 15 euros, we could tell you who the right one is. We, you don't, we can tell you it's wrong, but if we have all the animals genotyped, we can actually tell you who's right as well. Okay? So there are a lot of other additional benefits, like inbreeding. I told you how we can use that DNA technology, mating advice. We've now developed, as of, I think, around three days ago, a new mating advice system in Ireland, which is going to incorporate genomic information. 
there's going to be some funny people seeing their brothers and sisters getting mated, but you can see now, hopefully, that that, that can actually happen. Free composition. You know, you go to your favourite restaurant or some, some people that might be McDonald's and you buy an Angus steak, that's generally not tested if it's Angus or not. This technology can tell you how much Angus is inside that animal. Diagnostics. I'm a geneticist, and I could probably tell you which one of those is diseased. But if they were actually the same, it'd be very difficult. If they're exactly the same animal or if they weren't actually clinical, it'd be very difficult. So you could use genomic technologies to tell you which, what is your genetic predisposition to disease. And you might say I'm crazy, which I am, but if we look at cancer genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, which most people are probably familiar with in humans, and their risk, their increased risk associated with the different cancers. And you might say, that's brilliant. And I actually, my wife bought me um, a DNA test a few Christmases ago, and um, I, I, what I realized was it was going to tell me what I was going to die of. But you might say, why do I want to know that? Well, you can, you can enhance your screening, right? So if, it was, if you had these genes, you could test for cancer more often. If you had an animal who's predisposed to TB, and I know little about TB, but you could, you could use this, what do you call it, Simon, this more, the, the, the more, not the restrictive, when the herd is restricted, it's a more sensitive test or something, like that. or you could use interferon gamma or something on these animals where you think they have a higher predisposition to TB. Mastitis, you could just pre-squirt, make sure you pre-squirt that cow every time you, you're going to milk her. Prophylactic treatment and also management or chemo prevention. In a big feedlot, you could manage the animals in different sheds. Right? And I know I said that I didn't look at um, the talk or read the manual. I also didn't look what everybody else was talking about. And it so happens I have a slide on TB. So we did this. This is not genomic. We based it purely on pedigree from the Irish data, where we did a genetic evaluation for TB. And back in some year, a long time ago, we, we ranked the bulls based purely on their parentage, pedigree index, for the worst 10% genetics for TB, the best 10% genetics for TB. And we followed them through. The worst 10%, 31% of those cows got TB eventually. And the best 10%, only 5% of them got TB. Right? So, no, it's not going to eradicate TB, but there is a huge potential there. And it's not necessarily about breeding with the best bulls or the best rams. I would argue it's more almost about making sure the worst ones never get into widespread use. So you can breed in both ways. Opportunities, new paradigms in data analytics, machine learning, deep learning, all fancy, sexy terms, precision ag, it's all out there, vast quantities of data. Everybody is actually talking about data. If we look at the ICBF database, none of what I'm talking about here would actually be achievable unless we actually got all of this amalgamated into the centralized database. So there's data coming in from AI companies, milk recording, you can see them all coming through, the quantity of records are actually there. One million AI records coming in per year. 660,000 milk recording records coming in per year, four times per year. Genomic data, all going into the central depository, BERT records, etc. It allows us to actually get stuck into it, do the research, and then immediately and seamlessly apply or deploy to farmers. The challenges, and those that are fast would have seen my challenges are exactly the same as my opportunities, which is true. And I've been through this era of genomics in particular where there was massive expectations and no validations. And I, somebody said that there were a conference re recently on meat science where I poo-pooed all the meat science genomic research that has been done because it was never properly validated. And actually, now we know it didn't work. And it actually gave genomics a bad name. So you will see this big push for these technologies. Machine learning and deep learning are the two big things now. We've done a lot of them. They're not any better to the simple stuff that we use. Right? Um, so it is, it is a much of a challenge. GDPR, data ownership, privacy, and access, that's also going to be important. There's a thing called Moore's Law, which says that computing power is, is doubling um, per year. That's good, but it's actually not fast enough. And also, and I know this is probably petty and trivial, but institutional rules about sharing of data and the ICT system is absolutely hampering what we're doing. You cannot, the comm system, Dropbox, whatever you're using, Skype, they don't work, and how can you collaborate in those types of situations or share the data? Um, I'll skip through that one, and what I want to finish off of is just a case study on what I call the KISS principle, is a lot of people are talking about efficiency. If we actually look at efficiency, it's, it's, it's output divided by input, and a lot of people are talking about feed intake, and they're measuring daily feed intake. That's this component, so it's the intake of your surplus animals, your, your fattening stock, whatever. Most people, I think, often unknowingly, are working on feed intake per day. They're using these things called residual feed intake, which is per day. But if the animal has taken five months longer to finish, it's actually eating more. So 
the, the KISS principle to me is number of days. And you'd be surprised how this has not ever been looked at. If we can reduce the quantity of time an animal is eating for, so in other words, finish it earlier, at the same carcass weight and fat score, then that animal has less capital cost, less labor cost, less feed cost, and less methane, or greenhouse gas emission cost, arguably. Right? So what we have done, we've looked at that, and there is phenomenal variability in there. The good news is we have the data. Since BSE, we have to record birth dates and we have to record slaughter dates. The difference between the two of them is age of slaughter. So we actually have all this data to immediately try a or use a trait like this and reduce the age at which we're killing animals for the same carcass weight and confirmation and grade scores. You can do all that kind of fancy stuff if you like. So take home message, final slide. Big data and precision agriculture definitely has the potential. Uh, you might say I'm a bit negative towards it. I just got around 30 million euros to work on this area, so I'm, I'm positive towards it, but I'm positive towards it conservatively. And it could become an unwelcome distraction. And I would argue genomics, as was originally promised, so we're now talking about genomic selection, that wasn't originally promised, right? Genomics, as it was originally promised in animals, has not delivered this potential. And a lot of people now have kind of put that to the wayside and forget that they ever talked about it and moved on to precision agriculture. Right? And that is, that is really my, my biggest worry. And the biggest thing for us, and from Chagas being an applied research station, is the fundamental principles do not change. Big data genomics is only a tool to help us achieve our end goal. Thank you very much.